so. So uh, Hackaday readers should be intimately familiar with our next speaker, uh, past Supercon attendees, and just about everyone in the community. He's an electronics designer, um, host of the AMP, co-host of the AMP Hour podcast, creator of Contextual Electronics, and he has 15 years of electronics design, consults on projects ranging from cellular connected devices to large scale power generation. He's a champion of QuiCAD, so please welcome to the stage, Chris Gamel. Thanks, Brian. You really got that. You really nailed that. You really nailed that, that phrase. Uh, hi, my name is Chris Gamel, and today I'm going to be talking. I'm going to uh, be talking about circuit toolboxes. Um, basically, how to build out your mental library and some ideas for what you should be, what you should have on hand for when you run up against a problem in your next circuit. So, first, a little uh, imposter syndrome. Uh, Brian mentioned I've been doing this for 15 years, and yet working in like analog, well, first off, being here, but then second off, uh, you know, working in analog engineering and then also just with the community, you still talk to people that have been doing this for 30 years more, and so you never feel like you know enough. And that's kind of also the, the genesis of this talk, you know, like 30 years in, or sorry, 15 years in, you still, there's a lot to learn, which is great. Uh, like Brian mentioned, I also uh, run the Amp Hour, so you get to talk to really interesting people doing interesting things. Uh, but again, that kind of hits the old confidence nerve and uh, teaching people also really makes you realize how well you know something. So I do recommend, you know, if you ever get a chance to teach, it's a great way to kind of dig in and figure out what you need to learn. Uh, I also consult now, and uh, yeah, another one where it's a confidence game and chips away. So <laughs> with that great introduction, let's, uh, let's, let's jump into this stuff. Um, the, I think the big, the big uh, misconception, and one that I used to have a lot as well, is that you don't just you know, you don't just get to know this stuff one day. You have to f source your ideas from somewhere. And so that's where a lot of, a lot of the research comes from. Uh, so app notes are a definite one. Uh, data books are the old ones. But the, the really interesting one is when I was kind of searching around and trying to find more ideas for this talk and just in general in life, uh, there's the cookbook books that are out there. And these were really interesting, uh, a thing that developed over the years before the internet where they would basically take old data books, rip all the circuits out, and then put them into a cookbook or a encyclopedia. And so I was down at the Chicago Public Library flipping through thousands and thousands of pages of 1950s circuits all the way up to you know the 90s. And a uh, great way to see what's been out there over the years. Uh, another one for me is chatting with people, of course, you know, getting to know people here at Supercon, uh, but just you know, people you know from over the years and can ask, hey, how do you, you know, how do you protect your battery circuits? How do you do that kind of stuff? Uh, of course, I have my old circuits that I can use as a reference point, uh, and that helps a lot as well, especially because they're proven, and I'll talk about that a little bit, uh, especially the proven part, because if you're searching for new things, you can always go on Google Image Search, but that's a little bit dubious. And then finally, of course, without Hackaday, where would we be? So uh, there's, there's some references in here as well. Um, as things have changed over time, right, so uh, the world doesn't usually look like a Jim Williams app note. And if you don't know Jim Williams, he was an uh, applications engineer for linear tech, uh, you'll see one of his circuits later. Just brilliant guy, like savant, circuit designer, through, through uh, every, everything he knew at problems, uh, but really complicated stuff. And when you go and you're searching for a resource, you're trying to find a new circuit to, to implement and help you out, most of the time it doesn't look like that stuff because you either, you know, it's an open source design and you're cost constrained or you just don't need it or like I'll talk about later too, there's, there's silicon that has popped up in the meantime that enables you to do that kind of thing. Uh, also, like I mentioned, looking through these encyclopedia books, uh, it's really interesting. You know, you'll see things like how to drive a seven-segment display on a microwave, and it's like, well, why would you ever do that with discrete logic these days? You, unless you're really, really cost-constrained, uh, you'd probably do that. You know, I mean, even these days, you see three-cent microcontrollers, right? So, I mean, a lot of the ways that that processing has changed over the years means that the methods have changed as well. That all said, uh, you know, you're still gonna find a uh, you're still going to run into problems where you need you need some uh, some toolbox components here. So uh, trust but verify. Uh, so if you do go onto uh, Google Image Search, as I do, and I'm sure many of you do as well, I think that's like one of my number one tools here. Uh, trust but verify, but don't really even trust, right? So um, one of the things that you often see is like you you know you search for uh, current protection circuit, right? You see this great diagram. You go and you you're like, oh yeah, that looks great. I'm going to go click on that and then, and then you go to Stack Exchange and then someone like 
hey, does this circuit, will this circuit ever work? And it was, no, of course it won't, it'll never work. Uh, so, you know, the verification could be spiced, but really it's about building it, trying it out, getting on your circuit board, getting on a breadboard, getting on your, you know, prototype however you can, you know, present out for a cheap PCB and, uh, and make sure that you actually have this thing working before you put it in your, your final design. So that's kind of a caveat, caveat emptor for what you're about to say here too. So, you know, like these are all circuits on the screen that you'll be able to see and enjoy, but, uh, you know, test them out. Don't, don't, uh, don't just trust, also verify. Uh, here's a little, uh, little hackaday thing. Uh, yeah, you know, should have done it with that 555. You see this as a, as a comment in the, let's say the old Hackaday comment section. Uh, uh, but, but maybe in, uh, you know, like that actually might be the case here, right? You might actually want to do, uh, you know, you might use a 555. But, but really the idea is that we're going to be going over concepts and problems that you might run into. And the myriad, there's, this is going to be one way to solve these problems. We're going to kind of talk about types of, of methods to solve these problems. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of ways to solve these problems as we'll go over. So let's uh, dig in. So first off, we're gonna talk about just basic stuff, uh, really basic, as you'll see. Uh, this is just things that I have in my toolbox every day that I do a new schematic. What am I uh, using to make my designs better, hopefully? Um, also, I, I realize I didn't put this in the slides, but um, we're gonna be talking about some components you might not recognize, right? So if you're a real beginner, you know, either internet-based or here in person, uh, you know, we're gonna be going over to Zener diodes and diodes and p-channel FETs and all these things that, you know, everybody's at a different spot in their uh, their learning process. So definitely there's a lot of good uh, resources online. Like I said, Hackaday is a great, re great resource. Wikipedia can help you on any day of the week. Um, but, you know, just keep looking at new things and uh, keep getting exposure to this stuff because eventually it'll, it'll start to click. So uh, first things first, the LED, the uh, humble LED, as I wrote about. Um, this is a, a big one because uh, think about troubleshooting your boards. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times where I've made a board and I, I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, it's not lighting up, something's broken. And then it's, no, I didn't actually put an LED on here, just tying it to the rail and through a resistor just to make sure that when, when the power flips on, your thing lights up, right? It's a very simple thing, but you can use this, uh, use this process over and over again, right? You can throw it onto a microcontroller pin. You can, you know, you can have it as an in indicator as we'll see in a couple other circuits here. On the right side here, we, uh, we actually see a circuit that allows you to to have uh, kind of a dual mode, so an on-off indicator, right? So current flowing uh, normally through, uh, it would be like red, a red LED on one side, and then when you flip the switch, uh, green LED instead turns on, but all in the same package. Uh, you obviously could separate that out as well, but maybe you wanna have that in the same location on your board. Uh, this is a big one for, you know, so SparkFun sells these as boards, uh, but you know, you see logic shifters, and this is one of many ways to do it. Uh, I just really like this circuit as a, as a it's just a clever way to do it. And, and you know, when I really got down to it, I was like, uh, oh, okay, I have to kind of analyze what's actually happening here, right? So, so, um, so level shifting, right? You have three, three on one side, you have a micro that's on a newer process, maybe even less than that. And then you have an old five volt part. You want to talk to the two. Uh, who's seen this circuit before? Anyone here? Okay, good amount of people. Uh, and so, so what happens here is on the, on the left side, when, when LV1, that would be like the microcontroller that has a 3.3 3 .3 volt rate, uh, output, Right? When that's low, basically Q1 turns on, right? because the voltage difference between the uh, LV, that, uh, the 3.3 volt rail, and LV1, which is the, the, the little uh, the output here, right? there's, a, uh, there's current flow through that resistor, that turns on the FET, and then uh, HV1 on this side uh, gets pulled low, basically. When LV1's high, uh, nothing happens because uh, Q1 turns off, and then so then on the right side, that gets pulled up, uh, and then on the other side, this is bidirectional. So now uh, when HV1 is low, what happens there is actually it pulls through the body diode, it pulls that whole thing low, and uh, then LV1 gets pulled low. And then when HV1's high, boy, it's a lot of HV and LV, um, but when these get, uh, when HV1 is high, uh, nothing happens really. And then on the, the left side, uh, it gets pulled high by the R3. Does that make any sense? Okay, cool. Not many heads nodding. Do you guys like circuits? Is this okay? We're cool, we're cool here? Yeah. Okay, cool. It's like my life, so, you know. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, diode O-ring. Uh, uh, kind of, I call this brokering as well. I'm not sure what the actual term is here, but uh, this is a very, very common one for me. Uh, and this is just so I don't blow stuff up, right? Um, so on the left side here, so we got two circuits. On the left side here, um, imagine you have a, a USB micro, and then you also have like a, a barrel jack, right? Very common, you see on Arduino boards or really anything. 
but this concept can be used a lot of places. And so imagine the barrel jack is 5.01 volts, and then the, the USB is exactly 5 volts. In that case, what happens is the top diode, D3, that starts conducting, right? And then uh, the, the voltage through there is going to be just slightly higher, right? It'll probably be a 2 volt drop, right? So you got 5.01, a little bit of math in, this, in the sky here. But you have 5.01 through the 0 0.2 volt drop, you're going to have 4.81 here. And because 4.81 is probably higher than, uh, is, is going to be uh, back biased from the drop that would happen through uh, D4, right? So that's going to be back biased now. So no current will flow from the bottom one, it'll only flow from the top one. And that's great, right? So now when you have a higher voltage thing plugged in, that's going to source current through uh, the regulator and not the circuit. If you go and unplug that higher voltage one, then the USB takes over and it goes there. The problem with this, of course, is uh, batteries, right? That's always the problem these days. And so you have a USB plugged in. So now on the right side, this is the Adafruit from the, uh, if you have used the, feather, anyone use the feather board here? The feather set of boards, really great, great product, one of my favorites. Uh, and so in this case, they have a LiPo on there. And so you don't want to give up that voltage uh, from a battery. And so what you do instead is, so when the V-Bus is here on the left side, the 5 volts there, and it conducts through D, uh, sorry, D4 as well. It's a different, different schematic, so also D4. Uh, and so, so that starts to conduct through D4. And then when you pull the USB away, uh, what happens then is, uh, and this is a P-channel FET, right? So this is normally on. So when the V-Bus was there, it actually pinched it off. And so when you then remove that V-Bus, it gets pulled low by this resistor, R9 something. Uh, and so it starts to get pulled low, and that, that opens, or sorry, that, uh, uh, it's now pulled low, so then the channel opens, and the battery can actually start to source current to this uh, regulator. So what you do is you basically remove that voltage drop from, from the battery side of things, which is great. Okay, um, button debounce. Now this looks familiar. Uh, so uh, this is common on a lot, of, uh, a lot of boards. You don't necessarily need to do this in hardware, but when you do, it, uh, Elliot has a great uh, set of articles here about button debounce. And uh, you can also do this in software. Also Jack Gansel, uh, another one, another great resource as well, has a bunch of stuff about this. But, but honestly, it's, it's almost as simple as having an RC here, right? So if you have a, a button that's going to be pulling low, you just want to slow that whole thing down, right? You basically have, you know, if you hit a button, you could very rapidly turn on and off, and you don't want to trigger this thing on and on, over and over again. And so in that case, you basically slow the thing down. Then it also goes through the, the 74HC14 uh, to the microcontroller. So that's a nice little thing there. Uh, great series from Elliot. Another one, another basic, right? So we're getting, you know, obviously, <laughs> This is, uh, you know, some people that are in the audience that are not new to electronics are like, yeah, of course, Chris, but, you know, we're all at different spots. Uh, but this is one that goes on a lot of my designs. IO expansion, you don't have enough pins. You're using, like, maybe a PIC-12 or something small. You want to get more stuff out of there. Uh, and so what you do is you just use the 74HC595. You send some uh, serial out through there, and then you, you basically shift out. This is a shift register. And you shift out, and then each pin can act as an individual IO. In that case, right, you can go from, you know, if you had a serial pin that you repurposed as GPIO, you'd have one LED, now you have eight. Great. There's also I squared C ones, and there's lots of way to, ways to get uh, past this, but, uh, you know, this is one easy uh, thing to do. Okay, so this is the, uh, the basis for this talk. I'm thinking about why I was uh, going to talk about the uh, circuit toolbox in the first place and, uh, you know, how to save your next design. Uh, I've blown up a lot of circuit boards. Anyone else here blown up circuit boards before? I got, I got one waving hand down here. Okay. Uh, and so, <laughs> yeah, so it, uh, it's kind of the, the way of life in electronics, unfortunately. Uh, and it doesn't have to be, but, you know, maybe you were rushing, maybe you didn't have, maybe you didn't have the, uh, you know, the, the money to put into the protection circuitry. But when you do, let's talk about how we can save some boards. Let's talk about some basic components first. Um, so fuses, yes, uh, great. Uh, so if you basically short this thing to ground, you, a fuse is, is, think of it like a tiny strip of metal. When it heats up, it, it basically opens up that connection and no more current's gonna flow through there. MOV is a, a nonlinear device that when you start seeing voltage spikes, it shorts through the thing, right? And so in this case, it's just showing it through a generic DC to DC converter here, but uh, uh, you know, just to try and get these all on one screen. Uh, but then, the, oh, it was kind of sat on top of each other. But the one on the right side here is a PTC thermistor. That's a different type of device where uh, normally uh, current flows through it. And then because of the current that's flowing through it, right, uh, uh, P equals I squared R, right? So as you have current flowing through a thing and there's an innate resistance there, as it heats up, the actual the, the uh, resistance of that material changes and it goes up 
exponentially usually, and as you do that, then uh, it kind of starts to pinch off the current because now it's a higher resistance device. So it's great for putting those in, you know, they're pretty expensive, but you put them in line and if you have too much current flowing, say you short off on the right side of the screen there, uh, then it, uh, it, you know, it's not a super fast thing, but it's, it's, a, it's also referred to as a reset, resettable fuse, and that's great. And then finally, TVS diodes. This is great for, you know, if you have ESD out in the field, you pop this thing, with, you, say you're Will C and you've got a 14 kV uh, transformer at, at the night of Supercon, but well, you're probably not going to survive that, but if you've scuffed your feet on the carpet because you, you wear wool sweaters and you live in Chicago in the winter, that might just save your, your hide. So uh, these are just some basic protection components. And uh, some of these are going to be uh, components that you can, you know, th these should just be a, a regular part of your vocabulary. Uh, so if you've never seen them before, go and uh, research those a little bit more. Another one, uh, anyone ever uh, put a battery in backwards and blown things up? Okay, got one here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's a common one. And, and, you know, basically you can, just as easily, you can put a diode in line. But like I was talking about earlier, putting a diode in line, you, you, you're going to drop some voltage, and in, in doing so, when you have current flow through there, you're also going to basically burn some power up there. And for literally, batteries are in the, the name here. You don't want to do that. That's, that's a bad idea. Uh, so what we do here is basically uh, we have a, a P-channel FET, right? And normally, that is doing fine, right? It's tied to low with the resistor. It's going fine. It's, it's, uh, it's flowing through there. No big deal, right? Uh, current flows from drain to source, goes to the load. Great. Now, when you flip it over, though, uh, you basically have... The, uh, the positive voltage now on the gate refer reference to the, uh, the, the, the diode, or sorry, the, the drain, but then through the diode, it's referenced to source as well. And uh, you basically turn that on and pinch the whole thing off. And uh, that's a nice little, nice little way to, to save your high there. Another one. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, anyone have a uh, lithium ion battery ever go off behind your head? <laughs> no? Uh, okay, yeah. I, uh, so at my workspace, um, uh, there were some some nice young young gentlemen working on an electric skateboard, and they punctured a battery, and I just heard hissing and started running. Uh, so uh, that, that I guess this, this wouldn't help with nails or whatever they were using to puncture by accident. But uh, but uh, lithium ion, as you know, are magical fire bags, and uh, yeah. So uh, you got to be careful, and you don't want to uh, much like you don't want to overcharge them, you don't want to undercharge them. And so this is a, a simple little circuit here. Basically, what you do is you have this resistive divider. You see. You know, like you, you're not going to see in many uh, of these diagrams that I have up here, 0.1% resistor. And again, you might not actually uh, want to do this, but uh, the 0.1% resistor is going to give you some more precision there. And then in doing so, you set up a divider, uh, and then it's compared against the, the zener there, uh, which is setting up that one, or this is a, a reference, rather, dr drawn as a zener, because it's probably internal, 1.25-volt um, uh, reference there. And what you do is, is you get to a certain voltage, those two things compare, it flips over, the output changes, and then it it drags down the, uh, the again, P-channel FET. You're going to see lots of P-channel FETs in protection things because the idea is that normally current's flowing through them, and then you can turn it off uh, eventually, which is great. All right. Uh, this is a good one for uh, industrial. This is, so I used to work in the industrial realm, and uh, I, I really like this one because uh, when you have big machines that can source lots of current, you want to definitely try and stop them from doing that. If it, they'll, they'll, they'll put current anywhere. Um, and so what this is basically, uh, uh, so say you have current flowing from the 24-volt rail uh, at the top out through a, a screw terminal, because that's the only way industrial people know how to hook things together, uh, uh, out through a device, comes back in the top of the, uh, this is now an N-channel FET, right? And so it flows down through the FET, which you've activated, saying use pin 5 of this microcontroller off screen, the mysterious microcontroller. Uh, and so you have that uh, basically turned on the gate there Q of Q7, right? So basically now that channel's wide open, right? You're drawing as much current as you can through there. Well, what you do is you flow it down through the sense resistor down at the bottom, and then, uh, you know, as you have, uh, well, <laughs> as you have, uh, would it be 7 amps? I guess it would be 7 amps. Uh, about 7 amps or so, uh, you know, as you do. Uh, uh, th through that uh, 0.1 ohm resistor at the bottom, right, you get a 0.7 volt uh, or voltage that would develop across there. And what that does is it turns on the, the NPN over here and it yanks, it yanks that, uh, the gate down and it turns it off. What, what happens though is you have like a, a servoing mechanism that it's gonna stop at seven amps, but if it, if it backs off, it's gonna turn back off again, right? And, uh, or it's gonna let current go back through again. And so it's this great way to kind of to, uh, servo current out and it's, you know, if you'll see other circuits out there, this is effectively a current, uh, current source, right? So this is anything where you see a current source that's a good 
it's a good thing in your toolbox to kind of think, oh, how can I repurpose that when I need to limit current? All right. Uh, who knows what hot swap is? Okay, industrial people as well, as well maybe. Uh, so I used to work, uh, like I said, in the industrial industry. Um, and uh, it was like big card rack things. And what you do is you have this back plane and uh, <laughs> uh, they have these, these five volt rails because you know, everything was five volts back then. Uh, and the five volt rails, they used to say uh, it had enough current to quote unquote clear a short. And what that really means is blow the bejesus out of anything that crosses between five volts and ground. You know, 100 amp supplies, no, no big deal. Um, but what that means is if, if you have a capacitor out here, if C2 is asking for all the current you can give right as you plug that thing in, it's going to be like, okay. And so, uh, and so that's, uh, you want to not do that. That's, that's the important thing is to not do that. Uh, and so the, the fuse helps in that case. But what you also have is that uh, ZD1 is a zener. And as the, the, as the voltage builds up here, right? So again, we have a P-channel FET. No surprises there. Uh, and Q1 is, uh, is going to be, uh, sorry, that's not a, sorry, that's an N-channel FET this time. Sorry. Um, so that's not letting anything through at first, right? Voltage builds up on ZD1. It flows through. Uh, as soon as it gets to the, the right voltage there, it's going to flow through to R1. That's going to set up a voltage. Uh, it's going to have a little bit of a delay from C1 as well. And then that voltage that develops there on the gate of Q1 is going to slowly turn that on. And that's really what we're talking about here. You're trying to slowly ramp on that voltage. You know, it's a, it's a nonlinear device. It's not going to be like a snap-on, but it's going to be slowly, relatively slowly turned on if you zoom in on the scope, right? And that's the idea is that you, um, right, you softly start. Thank you, Charles. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, so this is a simple, simple version of that. Okay, now we get a little bit more complicated. Uh, so that one was kind of uh, what we showed two ago here. This is a low, shot, low side driver shutoff. Um, this is a little bit more fancy, uh, you know, electronic design, the old magazines. Uh, they used to have very fancy circuits. Uh, usually you could tell depending on what parts there was the most of in the circuit, you could tell what kind of parts they were selling, but um, that's okay. Uh, so what we have here though is uh, we have uh, N-channel FET here, right? So that's Q1. And so what, we've, what we first do is when we, when we hook this thing up, right? And uh, the first thing that's gonna happen is uh, through 12 volts, it's gonna go through R6, R7, and then turn on VOM1271, a very unfortunately named part. And what that is is actually a gate driver. And what that really is is you have um, it's an optocoupler, but there's uh, enough diodes and enough uh, light going through that it actually turn on the gate of Q1, right? So it's an optically isolated version to turn on Q1 there. It doesn't need to be referenced to anything, which is cool. Uh, and then, so current starts to flow. And again, you'll see our sense looks very similar as before. And then it flows out through our sense and then through the load there. And then over here, uh, oof, I don't have a, a, uh, a laser pen, but um, I see one and all those components around it. Anyone know what that is? Uh, shout it out. Anyone do analog? Okay. All right. I have job security. Uh, this is an instrumentation amp. Uh, and what that does is it basically uh, it measures uh, with common mode in place, right? So if you had, say, the load um, you know, was drawing some amount of current and then developed a, like a volt across the top of the load there, well, if you had a, a regular op amp there without the instrumentation amp um, set up like this, you, you basically would have to measure the volt plus whatever the voltage is across our sense. And at one volt, it's not that big a deal, but if you start to build up and up and up and up and you, that thing is floating up, you start to, the, the op amp says, well, I'm gonna probably dump some of this current through my protection diodes on the input, which is not what you want, right? You wanna actually measure the difference, differential amp, across our sense. And in doing so, so basically see R5 down there is adjustable, which you probably wouldn't do uh, if you had a, a product, you know, you would actually just set a resistor and say, good enough. But uh, setable resistor here, and then what you do is you basically have a set point for when this thing gets to one amp going through it or whatever you want it to pinch off at. Basically then I want, IC1 outputs a high. That then comes and turns on Q2, which was previously pulled low through R8. Q2 turns on, and that drags the whole thing down now, right? So you see there's 168 ohms up to the 12 volt. It drags the whole thing down, and then that basically goes and turns off VOM 1271. Uh, and so it's kind of circuitous to, to do that thing, uh, but it is interesting. So there is that. Uh, not going to win any, any awards from your boss to, for low cost, but uh, it looks cool, doesn't it? That's, that's a, a magazine circuit versus a production circuit. 
Oh, that's okay. Um, so uh, another one here. Um, uh, this is common of uh, any audio folks out there. Okay. Uh, the uh, audio, basically, I have a microphone uh, that I carry around, and basically, if you uh, if you put too much sound onto the microphone and then there's too much signal coming out of it, it lights up. It says, oh, this is an overload. Uh, this is kind of the opposite of that. It says lights up when you go outside, uh, when your input is, is too high and too close to the rail. So basically what you're doing here is you're just setting up R10, R11, R13, which is variable, and then R17. That's setting up like a stack of voltage here between these 30 volts of 15 volt rail, minus 15 volt rail. And what you're doing is basically at the input here, uh, it's, it's saying, okay, well, you set some, you had some set point here that you said, I want to be this far away from either rail. And if it's too high or too low, then these dual TL072 op amps turn on. And the reason there's D6 and D7, those are diodes. And the reason those are there is that so when, when, uh, when the bottom op amp turns on because it's too low, uh, then it doesn't back bias into the top op amp. That's kind of the idea there. And then from there, it flows down through the R15, R16, and R18. That sets up Q6 to turn on. When Q6 turns on, the light turns on. OK, so that's another LED you might have in circuit. All right. Um, this is pretty simple. Uh, basically, you have just an enable pin, and you want to turn on, so you want to control the uh, input to your L LM7805, right, your regulator that's there. Um, I, I wouldn't normally recommend to do this. I, I think this is just kind of another kind of interesting circuit because all of the power that goes, not only going to be burning power on the 5-volt the regulator, right, you're also going to be burning power on the tip 32 that's there, right, the, the, uh, the PNP that's there. Uh, so I wouldn't normally recommend that, but it is kind of interesting. Now, the, reason, the note that's at the bottom here is this is something that I did recently, uh, and this is something that's relevant for a lot of low power design these days. You can have a whole separate part of your circuit, right? So I have a circuit right now I'm working on that's a comparator. I want to just turn it on, I'm going to take a measurement, I'm going to turn, turn it off, and then put the whole thing back to sleep. But I don't want to do that on a micro, I want to do that externally. So what I do is I have the micro turn on an enable pin to what is now effectively this, but encapsulated in a part. Turns on, that powers the op amp that's down the line. It takes a measurement, sends it back, the ADC turns, uh, you know, takes the measurement, and then you turn off the enable pin, this section shuts down, and then you gently shut down your microcontroller, right? This is common low power design type stuff. Um, and you wouldn't necessarily want to do this, but again, this the reason it's the toolbox circuit is because a lot of times you get into scenarios where you maybe you can't do that, right? You can't you can't use a, a part that has an uh, an existing uh, feature like an enable pin or something like that. So you have to have this stuff around it. Okay, quick drink. Um, has anyone used a part? Or has anyone designed a circuit recently that does not have a micro on it? Okay, a couple. That's great. Uh, uh, a couple more than I thought there would be, actually. I mean, so again, if you look at open source designs and if you look at just kind of the stuff that's out there, micros are so cheap and so ubiquitous, you kind of see them everywhere. But as people who work on hardware that has microcontrollers on it, right, a lot of the problems that happen, they happen before the whole thing wakes up and starts executing code. And so that was another thing I was thinking about toolbox stuff is you need to be able to move outside of the micro sometimes, aside from the, you know, maybe not being a huge fan of firmware as some of us on stage are. Um, and so let's look at some of this stuff. Power on reset, you probably see a lot of times in, uh, this is you know touted in a lot of uh, data sheet for microcontrollers, right? What happens is basically when it, when it senses that power is applied, it goes and it resets itself and all the code execution gets reset as well. Well, you can actually do that in, uh, externally and that was the only way to do it in the past. So what we here have here is just an RC and a Schmidt trigger and uh, you know as the power develops, uh, you know, you have a, a certain time constant through the RNC, and then as that sets up and those two things equate, then it, uh, it turns, on, turns on the reset. Simple. Uh, this is another one for codeless stuff, right? So this is uh, when I do tutoring through, uh, through my course, um, a lot of times I'm telling people, look, you don't know what your micro pins are going to wake up as, right? You hope you do, but you, you don't necessarily. And so simple things like doing pull-down resistors, on, so you have an N-channel FET that's basically, you know, again, generic microcontroller turning on a FET, an N-channel FET through this, uh, you know, this R here is gonna actually set up with a C on that, uh, the gate capacitance of, of that, uh, that transistor there. But the R and the C are gonna, uh, you know, it's gonna have some slight turn on time because of that, the resistance and the capacitance of the gate. Um, 
and that's going to turn on here. It's going to pull current down through the, the coils of the, uh, the relay, and the relay is going to close, right? The common, common relay closure type thing. Uh, but you don't want that to fire every time you turn on your micro because you don't know what the state of the micro pin is. And so what you do is you add just a pull down here, right? So very simple. You now have stated your, uh, your intention to the circuit, right? So you have a 100K pull down. It's sitting close to ground, and you say, I'm going to overcome. When I need to turn this thing on, I will overcome that 100K of resistance pulled to ground. You're going to source a little bit of extra current, but it's worth it. Now, uh, the 555, it made, it made the, the appearance here. This is, uh, this is from uh, D-Lab circuits. Uh, and uh, basically, again, this is another thing that's inside of almost every modern microcontroller, right? You have watch watchdog timers. Sometimes, uh, you know, you have problems with that because if you can't turn off the watchdog timer internally, you have trouble with, with uh, uh, debugging. And, uh, you know, because if, if you don't respond in time, you, you get into a, a debug loop and, uh, uh, then you, you can't turn that stuff off. Uh, but now if you do move it, you decide to move it external, then you can uh, do that here. Basically, the idea is uh, uh, pin P17 on this micro goes and uh, pulls this thing low, and then that resets the trigger line on the IC. Ah, this is, uh, this is one that I've realized uh, as I was working on this presentation. Uh, I had a blue screen, and uh, maybe many of you have done this before, but as you push down the button on your, uh, your computer, you hold it down, and uh, within uh, you know, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, it actually hard reboots. Well, in, the, in there, there's a chip that's actually sitting there waiting for uh, you, know, for you to keep holding it down, and in doing so, it then goes and tugs on, tugs on a reset line. That is circuitry in there that is usually not tied to the actual controller itself. Uh, this goofy fella here, he has a great, uh, this, uh, great uh, on off. Basically, this is uh, a re reducing uh, parts on your board. That's what Dave was talking about when he did this. Uh, but you know, also, if you want to have a soft button on your device with a push button versus a latching switch like this, this is a circuit that allows you to do this. I am running out of time here, so I'm going to start doing this as well. This is another one that I learned from the consulting forum that I run. Uh, this was uh, recommended by Kitspace. Uh, Kaspar uh, has done this a couple times as well from Mosaic. But basically, this one is basically a, 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 you push it on and then you hold it to turn it off. Right? You, uh, that could be useful for a lot of industrial products that you need. You want to make sure you don't have accidental pushes. Okay, we're going speedy up here. Uh, so signal path stuff, low leakage diodes, this is, um, again, this is not gonna protect your circuit as much, but like I showed with the TVS diodes, you can do very similar things on your signal line, so you protect them. The problem is when you put diodes on a signal line, you also start leaking current through them. And so what you can do, uh, you can basically tie off the pins from an op amp, especially really, really nice op amps, where you can then go and use the low leakage diodes that are internal to op amps, tested for low leakage, and then you can use those as similarly as protection mechanisms for your, your signal lines, but then you get all the low leakage characteristics like you have in op amps. You're gonna pay through the nose for it, but you know, that's great. And then here is the Jim Williams circuit. I'm not even gonna attempt to show you here, but I do recommend app note 28 and all Jim Williams app notes. They're all available in a book as well. Uh, basically this is, uh, what he would do is he would uh, do an analog measurement, convert it to frequency, push it through a transformer, and then on the other side, then, uh, reconvert it to analog and then go and measure it and push it into an ADC. Uh, insane stuff. The 0.01% thermocouple amplifier in case you need one of those. Uh, yeah, good luck with that. Uh, so uh, all this said, and I, I do have to hurry up here, but um, all this said, all of the circuits I've shown you, they've all been repurposed. They've all been put into silicon. So you don't have to do any of this stuff. You can go and buy a chip that does this. The advantage, of course, is that you have smaller circuits. You, uh, you get more applications. You get stuff that you might not be able to do on your own, but in this case, uh, you know, you get all that extra stuff. The disadvantage, well, if that part's out, you're out. You don't, you're, you are screwed. And so that's the downside. So in this case, this is a programmable over voltage protection controller, right? So this is similar to the early stuff I showed with P-channel FETs. Uh, this one is one that I didn't even come close to showing. This is a isolation uh, part from analog devices. Basically, you can isolate an entire USB, all four, uh, all the data lines and the power, right? So you have a completely isolated solution on the other side of it. You plug in USB on the other side, you have, I mean, this is an $8 module, basically, but it's like, it's like magic, right? Same thing, uh, isolated gate driver. This is similar to the one that I showed you there, uh, but much more complicated, right? So if you're trying to drive a, uh, if you're trying to, you know, pass a load dump test in an automotive application, but you need to make sure you're isolated from one thing or another. Again, this is a very similar, the ISO family from TI uh, doesn't use coils, it actually uses capacitive coupling from one side of an isolation barrier to another, but you can get, you know, 4 kV of isolation. And then finally, this is the uh, similar to the 
the circuit I showed where I was holding my head in my hands, uh, instead of making your own circuit, this is a, you know, Green Pack is a reconfigurable device. It's a one-time programmable, but it, you know, you can set up interesting functions. So now you set, if I hold this button down for 10 seconds, then fire, you know, do a one shot and you're, you're, you, do a, you do a reset, right? And so um, I'm gonna skip all this stuff, unfortunately. Uh, mental toolbox, uh, as you saw, the, a P-channel, uh, you know, that's great for power enabling and also pinching off power when you need to. Timers are great for reset loops. Transistors are great for building current sources and limiters. But like I, I want to reiterate, the best ones are the ones that you've tested and you've tried out. Um, if you want more, uh, do some research, right? Uh, you know, ask around. Uh, I run a consulting forum now. If you want to get in on that, that's a great thing. But, you know, joining communities, Hackaday, EEV blog, the Contextual Electronics Forum, all of these things are great places to go and find new information. Uh, Go and find app notes. Uh, if you really want to, do like uh, Mr. Krasno in the back there, and do uh, you can get, look at patent applications if you really want to. There is information everywhere, but uh, it's a great way to do it. Here's all my information. If you want to find me, I have a couple websites. And uh, thanks a lot. <laughs>